tell us your name. Okay. <laughs> Spell it. <laughs> okay. Richard Missouri. Most people call me Dick, and Missouri is spelled M E S E R V E Y. Okay. Why don't you talk, tell us by talking about you know, what's your educational background and what brought you to the site and when? Oh, okay. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in physics from uh, Western Illinois University back in Macomb, Illinois, and uh, with a specialty in nuclear physics, and uh, my professors uh, realized that Idaho was one of the last places where they were still doing lots of physics work, and so they kept pressing on us to try to come to work out here, and uh, uh, another fellow who worked at SPURT, Jim Campbell, and myself were both seniors, and Jim came directly out here, and I was probably a little bit chicken-hearted and decided I didn't know anything about this part of the country, so I decided I'll go to graduate school someplace close, and if I like it, I'll try to go to work there, and if I don't like it, I'm headed right back to Illinois. <laughs> and so I went down to Utah State to graduate school, and uh, while I was there, I looked around and talked to people that uh, actually, because of the site here, a lot of the um, students at, uh, in, the, in the science department at Utah State were from Idaho Falls, so I got to talk to them a lot and find out about it, and decided I would uh, come up here and and uh, probably actually I decided that early um, Utah State's a wonderful place and and it, with all the mountains and uh, the exciting things going on it was a lot better than Illinois and so so I, I came up then after uh, graduate school there I got my master's degree in in uh, physics again and, and came up here to work and with the intent of working three years uh, to get it on my resume and kind of satisfy my professors at Illinois and then probably going back near my family in, in Illinois. And uh, every time I've gotten ready to do that, uh, starting three years after I began here, I, uh, there was always some really good reason not to leave. And in the early days, it was because uh, I just got a promotion into some interesting job or I was working on some super interesting project. And in those days, there were lots of new and exciting things going on. And it didn't make any sense to, to leave in the middle of some of those. And over the years, pretty soon the roots start to grow deeper. <laughs> and so it gets harder. And then uh, e even as recently as a few years ago, you realize, yes, you can go someplace else, particularly with a decommissioning background, because people are starting to do that all over the world. But um, it's the, the lifestyle and, and how you live at those other places is just not the same as it is here. It's uh, uh, more crowded and more expensive, and I think you have less freedom uh, in where you live and what you do and what you work on. We've always been very um, open, I think, here in terms of the kinds of things you could work on and the kind of projects you do and the involvement in those projects. And if you check with your fridge, you find out in lots of other places you only work on a little small part of a project. You, des you design the latch for the gadget, not the whole gadget, or you don't see the gadget operated. And we've always done the whole thing here, which made work very interesting. <clears throat> we, as uh, scientists or engineers, were allowed to design uh, experiments or uh, apparatus or equipment, and we went to the laboratory with the technicians to help build that equipment or the experiment, and we tested it and then we installed it in the reactors and we helped collect the data from, from the experiments in the reactors and analyze that data and then move on to the next phase of that project. So we, we actually were involved in all parts of it, not just some part, like just analyzing the data or just designing it or just building it. We, we were uh, allowed to participate in all phases of the projects, which made them really interesting. One of the uh, first uh, jobs that I had here that, that really involved a lot of physics was on the SNAPTAN program. But it was transient, was the, the tail end of it. Reactors that were planned to go in satellites to produce electricity for the instrumentation on board. And the concern they had was uh, if those reactors should, uh, uh, sh should the rocket abort and dump the reactor into the ocean, or during the transport to the launch site, if the truck would run off the road into a river or, or a, a lake or something, what happens if those reactors get 
suddenly dumped into water. And so we uh, built a, a double-wide railroad car just like they did with the, the aircraft engines and put a large tank on it, built the reactor in the center of the tank, uh, put a plexiglass shield around the reactor, and then uh, used explosives to fill the annulus with water, used explosives to drive the plexiglass shield off and let the water flood in on on the reactor and uh, to see what happened. And of course what happens, we got a tremendous fireball and, <laughs> and pieces of the reactor all over the place. My particular involvement with that reactor was to try to measure the fireball temperature when, when it exploded. And so I built a little, um, uh, actually looked very much like a, a those little triangular uh, pig houses that they use in the Midwest. And we used various kinds of shielding to shield out the neutrons and the gamma rays and, and the uh, beta particles that were generated uh, in the shielding as the neutrons hit it and, uh, and try to measure um, using electronics the, the fireball temperature at a distance of about 100 yards from the, the meter. And we used uh, front surface mirrors to reflect the, the fireball uh, back behind the shielding into the, the electronics. And, measured and then uh, we ran those tests and of course after the tests were over why we all had a big job of cleaning up the area and the debris from the reactor yeah. and, and they were all conducted uh, very much like the, the aircraft engine tests and that they were only run and under certain uh, weather conditions and when those weather conditions could be predicted for several hours into the future so that they knew the wind direction and so forth and so it's all very well controlled uh, just uh, open-air tests that probably wouldn't get conducted today. So. Uh, what <coughs> Transient. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a, <coughs> a small, re small reactor, uh, basically a core was about the size of a basketball and it was uh, titled Systems for Nuclear Auxiliary Power that was uh, intended to produce power for satellites, uh, the instrumentation in satellites. And the, the transient part was uh, there were transient tests designed to, to <coughs> really determine what happened if that reactor would be unexpectedly plunged into water. Is it, were any such reactors plunged in water? In real, in real uh, water? Not, to, not to my knowledge. Uh, it was one of those things that uh, I think the, the tests actually proved that, uh, yes, it scattered. Uh, fuel and stuff around a little bit, but it wasn't all that big an incident and the cleanup wasn't that difficult. We, we were able to clean it up pr pretty easily there. Um, okay, so that was the first thing you worked on? So uh, actually, the first thing was a, a, th a thing called a fuel plate resistance thermometer and they were trying to measure uh, in the SPURT-4 reactor, which was a, had a plate type core and they wanted to measure the temperature distribution in the fuel plates. And so we um, put various uh, voltage taps on the, uh, all over the fuel plate and then we could measure the voltage drop across the, uh, those taps, which is a function of the resistance in the plate and you could calibrate that and, and determine the temperature then. And so during uh, many of the SPURT-4 uh, tests, we were able to that way measure um, the temperature distribution in the fuel plate to see how it was performing and behaving and if hot spots were developing and those kinds of things. I think most of the reactor tests here indicated that uh, safety issues are a lot less than you would predict or ex uh, maybe expect or, or uh, worry about and that uh, they, as you heard last night, they uh, mostly shut themselves down in accident conditions and they don't develop the severe temperatures and difficulties and problems that, that, that you might expect and the, 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 mostly the tests that were done here over the years have shown that. So they're just not as dangerous as some people like to think maybe. Why do those people think they're so dangerous? Uh, they don't understand them, don't know about them and that's probably our fault for uh, <laughs> in the very beginning trying to uh, keep this a secret sort of thing and associate it somewhat with military actions and not tell the public and not explain to the public and not teach to youngsters in school things about nuclear processes. And things that we don't understand, we distrust. And I think that's pretty much where it started. 
Um, Phil Ginkle talked about how the military, you know, starting with the Manhattan Project run by the Army Corps of Engineers, that it really sort of carried over into the work at the site, that there was a lot of um, engineering mentality and sort of a military orientation of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, that later on, you know, he felt as the first civilian director of it that he helped to bridge this transition. But how would you characterize the influence of, of the military and of this broader sort of international uh, arena of the Soviets, you know, it, and the tensions in the United States and the competition not just for arms race but also for the um, science and technology prowess, you know, to, to mm -hmm. show them in, in Geneva at, mm -hmm. at these conventions that we were had. Well, I think uh, operations here uh, have been pretty much patterned after military type operations and we, and we have a, a strong military tie because the site, the Addo site, started as a Navy site, a Navy gunnery range to test uh, the large uh, uh, guns from the uh, battleships. And we used the same kind of security force and patterned things after that. We uh, wanted to keep things secret because we wanted to get ahead in not only the arms race, which was the military side, but the production of electricity from nuclear energy. And any spin-off from that that might be uh, give our country some advantage. And we actually did have quite a, a race to see who could produce commercial electricity first. And uh, we were in direct competition with Russia in, in that aspect. And we tried to keep things secret and, and, uh, and uh, to ourselves until we won that race. And we, I believe, did. Uh, Morax produced electricity for Arco. And, uh, and it was a, a real horse race to get there before, <laughs> before someone else did. So we could report at that Geneva conference that we had done that and uh, produced electricity from a reactor. And so not only did EBR-1 produce electricity to light a light bulb, but they, they then got in a race to use the uh, borax to produce electricity for a, a city or a town. And so it had a lot of military uh, connections or similarities in that respect. So that is in your work on, on the tram, or the snap tram, your work was mainly focused on, you know, the commercial <coughs> Uh, reactor safety. That, that's right. We, um, I think uh, SnapTran was probably the only uh, really military type application that I've worked on here. We've had other people I think that have done things, but um, most of my work has been directly in support of the commercial power industry. The site is famous for uh, building all kinds of reactors, you know, gas cooled reactors and liquid metal cooled reactors and uh, pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors and heavy water reactors and um, all of those things, um, um, organic moderated reactors, to, to look at the various types of reactors to see which would be uh, better suited for the commercial uh, pr production of commercial power. So most of what we've done here has been in the commercial sector and in fact in the early days there were two types of budget at Idaho defense budget and a commercial budget and mostly what I worked on was the commercial budget because it supported the development of commercial power. Loft and PBF and all those were uh, directed toward that. But the, the um, funds for the site were federal funds not not from private companies. Right. Was there some mix right. mi mingling of funds? Yeah. There, very little. Mostly it was federal funds and occasionally a private company would have some experiment done here or would buy into the program a little bit and to just get some information to support uh, commercial reactor designs, but I think very little of that over the years. People say the, the work done here, you know, created kind of a blueprint for the safe operation of reactors. Um, how did that transition work from the work you did here to actual incorporation in the designs that Westinghouse and General Electric and, and other companies were developing? Um, <clears throat> I think commercial companies um, learned from what we uh, did here uh, by reading the reports, attending conferences, having meetings with us, and 
uh, uh, trying to incorporate the lessons that we learned from the safety tests into their reactor designs. That was particularly true uh, once uh, our country had sort of settled on uh, w water reactor type designs as opposed to uh, uh, organic or air gas cooled reactors or, or liquid metal reactors. Uh, once they sort of settled on, um, on water reactor designs, then they uh, actually had a lot of input into the type and nature of the tests we run. So the, the semi-scale tests and the loft tests and the PBF tests were all kind of directed toward uh, reactor safety issues associated with, with water reactors. And uh, those safety issues were uh, the concerns of commercial reactor developers and we would just uh, de design the test to try to answer those questions. So there's a lot of interface back and forth and we got a lot of input from them on the design of our tests. Um, <clears throat> I, I, got in, I, I had spent the first part of my career uh, basically supporting the power reactor industry in ter terms of running tests at the various facilities here. And uh, then uh, I started to, to worry that I was working myself out of a job because I believed that either we would have run a large number of commercial reactors for a long enough period of time that people would quit worrying about the safety issues and asking those questions, uh, or that we would answer all the questions, which was really a silly <laughs> sort of an attitude. And so I started to, to believe that uh, my, my entire career had been spent in support of doing testing of uh, reactor concepts and, and the safety issues associated with them and no one would be interested in that anymore and I'd be out of a job and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So I started worrying about I need to do something else in my career. And so at that time we had a lot of soft energy programs, low head hydro and geothermal and solar and so forth and I thought, oh I'll bet that's the future. <coughs> uh, and so I started talking to my boss and other people in the company about transferring into one of the soft energy programs. And sort of arbitrarily, I selected solar, thinking, oh, that's going to be a good thing. And, uh, but I also had a lot of uh, sites and knowledge in instrumentation associated with these reactor tests. And my manager wasn't anxious to let me transfer someplace else. So he finally agreed uh, that I could transfer if I would hire a replacement and get that replacement up to speed. And it took a year or so to do that. And finally the day came when I, I had a, a replacement in, in place and, and he seemed to be up to speed and uh, I thought I could transfer. And so we had a big meeting and everybody sort of grudgingly, I think, nodded their head that I could go transfer to this new solar energy program. And a fellow named Fred Teeny managed the of the soft energy programs in and so when I um, called him and said well I'm ready to come over and, and join your program he said oh that's great I have a favor um, I uh, we EG&G &G had just taken over and uh, <coughs> the contract here and uh, he said we have a brand new program that's uh, the first new program that EG&G &G starts on its own it didn't inherit from the old contractor and we want it to look good and uh, we need to get it staffed and up to speed. And it's a D&D program and so forth and I'm listening to this and saying what is the D&D program and finally the discussion had gone far enough that I had to say you know Fred I'm sorry but I, I don't know what you mean when you say D&D. And he said oh you know decontamination and decommissioning you know that's in waste management. And at those, in those days waste management was literally a dump. You, I'm sure you're aware, they hauled it to a hole in the ground and dumped it in. And how do you go home and explain to your wife or explain to your parents that you've got all this education and you've worked on all these high-tech things and solved all the uh, reactor, these reactor problems and now you're going to go work in waste management? And I was just devastated because I'd burned my bridges. I'd hired a replacement and had him trained and now I was going to become a waste management guy. <laughs> And I was just devastated and I went home and talked to Gaylene about it. She's a lot smarter than I am so she said, well just do what he said. Uh, get it staffed and get it going and then transfer back to what you wanted to do. So, so I went back with that attitude and said, okay, let's do this and make a rather long story, hopefully shorter. What I found was uh, it was very refreshing to get sort of out of the laboratory into the field after a while and decommissioning was really a project management 
uh, sort of job, and uh, it was fun to take these old reactors and plan how to take them apart and dispose of the waste and look at technologies that would make that faster and easier and cheaper, and uh, you could you could go outside and it was wonderful to be <laughs> out in the fresh air and see these buildings come down and we used a lot of explosives in the early days and that was fun and uh, it just uh, was good and before I knew it I'd been there several years and had uh, been involved internationally in decommissioning so professionally it was really good for me and very very interesting so that's kind of how I got involved in it and it's been a, a wonderful ride. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see. Was there any thought to saving some of these reactors? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm a saver, and so uh, my belief is uh, you really don't uh, want to tear all these things down because they have historic value. Uh, we can surely reuse them for something else, and in fact, once you have a, a, a reactor facility built, there's a million other things you can do in it. And in fact, in the early days of our decommissioning program, we probably um, returned the facilities to some other use more than we returned it to a natural condition. And uh, the thought was, uh, in those days, the government still had uh, projects going, new kinds of work uh, coming here. They had the money for the projects, but not to build new facilities, so it made sense to decommission the facilities, clean them out for unrestricted use, and let a new program step in and use them. Uh, a SPURT 4 is a good example of that. We cleaned that facility out for unrestricted use, and it became a mixed waste storage facility. SPURT 3 became the WORF, the Waste Experimental Reduction Facility, and so forth. So in the early days, we reused lots of those facilities. Uh, as time progressed, uh, the facilities became older and older, and it became harder and harder to to bring them up to current standards and use them, and we found that new projects didn't want those old facilities because they were just hard to convert and bring up to modern standards. And so as time progressed, there's been less and less of that, uh, and now we have a mentality called footprint, footprint reduction, which says uh, get rid of them and so they don't show any place anymore, and so there's very little reuse done now. Now, Borax is a boiling water reactor experiment. It was designed as the country started to focus on water type reactors, and it was um, designed to answer a lot of the early safety questions about boiling water reactors and uh, what would happen under different kinds of uh, operational conditions. And they built a Borax 1 uh, to find out what happens when they just uh, drive that harder than they should and, and cause a steam explosion and, and blow up, and, and they did that. Uh, scattered it sort of all around the, the area and uh, the early the films of that thing you can see pieces of the reactor go tumbling out across the desert. When they finished that test uh, the uh, radiation field in the general area was about uh, my memory's going to fail me here uh, I think it was about 700 MR per hour just on the average in the desert area around the reactor. They believed that was because of the debris from the reactor that, and pieces of fuel that came out, so they picked all that up, and the <coughs> field was still about 700 MR per hour in that area with the pieces gone, which meant it was finely dispersed material uh, scattered around in the sagebrush. So they put a fence around it, uh, locked the gate, uh, bulldozed the, the hole in, filled it, uh, backfilled it with soil, uh, put the fence around it and just went away from it. Went to down the hill about 100 yards or so and, and built a new facility which contained four more reactors, actually two reactor vessels, uh, <coughs> but they, in each vessel they'd modify the piping or, or the core design and call it a new borax, so it was borax two, three, four, and five, uh, which was all in the same building and um, but consisted of two different reactor vessels. And, and that's, those are the, the uh, reactors that we think of that uh, produced the electricity, the light ARCO, and that, that did really the significant safety tests uh, associated with boiling water reactors. And those uh, were decommissioned here a number of years ago by um, removing everything above ground and entombing the reactor vessels and so forth. It's located very near 
you know, within a half a mile or less, third of a mile of the barrel ground in a massive concrete structure, it's really better to entomb it there than to cut it in little pieces and put it in plywood boxes and haul it a third of a mile and put it back in the ground. So, so it, those uh, reactor vessels are entombed at the old borax facility. Can you explain, um, when you talk about water reactors, if you could tell them about, you know, why are they called water reactors? What's the difference between a mm -hmm. boiling water reactor and a pressure water reactor? Right. It's, uh, we typically talk about water reactors, which means uh, water moderated type reactors and cooled. So there's, a, uh, we need to moderate or slow down the neutrons to make the, the chain reaction more efficient and we need to cool or remove heat from the reactor cores to produce steam to operate just conventional turbines, steam turbines, like any electrical plant would use to produce electricity. And <clears throat> that sort of separated into two types of water reactors, a boiling water reactor and a pressurized water reactor. And the boiling water reactor just operates at a, a lower temperature and pressure and the, uh, than the pressurized water reactor. The pressurized water reactor operates at about 2300 uh, PSI and uh, 600 degrees, so it's at a significantly higher pressure and temperature. And it's a little bit more efficient in some respects. Uh, there's a continuing controversy about which is most economical and which is safer and so forth. And in reality, there's not a, a great deal of difference. We have both kinds scattered around throughout the world now. So, uh, in talking about borax, it, you may want to contact. I, I put a note in this thing that you, that I gave back to you. You might want to uh, contact a fellow named Ray Haroldson, who I think is one of the two people, maybe three. At the he, he wasn't sure if the other fellow was still here or not, that actually worked on those things. He has fascinating stories about those things. He was uh, involved in them and, uh, and uh, operated them and was part of the, the test that, that uh, supplied electricity to, to Arco and so forth. And he has lots of details about those reactors. And m most of us are just uh, hearsay or, you know, we've heard the stories or read the stories. Uh, Ray actually worked on them. And, and if you want to pursue it further, why okay. I, I had, had okay. his phone number in there. So. Okay. Um, well, the next and you know, through the last kinds of questions would be just to try to get some more uh, statements about um, well, either stories, um, funny stories, <laughs> or or things that were very special, like you know things that you did that you felt was really terrific or, um, you know, fun to work on or great sense of accomplishment or whatever. Or um, talk about um, overall what the importance of the work done at the Idaho site has been. I mean, you've said, you have several statements to that effect. But, you know, mm -hmm. those are sort of three areas that, you know, we're always looking for, you know, more contributions. So if mm -hmm. you want to. Something okay. Comes to mind. Sure. But I think the Idaho site uh, plays a just a hugely important role in, in the nuclear history of the world, really, because <coughs> we've built and tested 52 different reactors here, and those include all kinds, all sizes, all types of tests, and uh, there's obviously a lot of very interesting um, aspects of, of that. We've had tiny reactors like the little basketball sized SnapTran reactor. We've had uh, large reactors like ATR, the, the advanced test reactor, which is the largest uh, test reactor in the world and had the, has the highest flux density of any test reactor in the world. And so, and everything kind of in between. So there's been just uh, lots of very interesting work from the identification of the uh, higher element isotopes uh, to the definition of the safety uh, boundaries for these various kinds of reactors. Um, <coughs> I think that uh, Idaho has been a very quiet place. It's isolated. The workforce here has not tended to travel, especially in the early days, as much and participate as much as some of the other, like uh, Oak Ridge as an example, and, and Richland. And things, so they just kind of quietly went about doing their work. We've always had a reputation, I think, of of doing uh, the stuff a little bit cheaper than other people and faster than other people. And uh, I think that's uh, 
sort of a trait here. And, you know, you don't build 52 reactors and test them uh, and not, and uh, you know, you, ha you have to do that quickly and pretty efficiently to get through all of that. Uh, I just uh, think there's been some world-class people come out of uh, the Idaho site uh, in terms of uh, in the early days in, in physics and in reactor safety, uh, for sure. There's, uh, I believe there's quotes uh, about, about people who, you know, are leaders in understanding uh, um, <coughs> the uh, reaction of, of zircaloy in, the, in these, uh, the, the cladding material in the new reactors uh, under accident conditions and uh, the development of uh, codes and standards and so forth to uh, associated with reactors. And so just a lot of work here. We haven't, uh, I think as a result maybe of the security involved in the early days, we just didn't say a lot about it and, and uh, it's been quietly going on here for a lot of years and they've accomplished a, a great deal in terms of the types of work they've done and the importance of that work. It really has set the, the way for the development of nuclear power in, around the world. Well, you know, as I indicated earlier, I planned uh, when I came out here to work for three years, uh, add that to my resume, and then probably go to work at an industry back in Illinois, perhaps Argonne National Laboratory, which was in northern Illinois and where I grew up, and, uh, and we had visited there as uh, school classes and so forth. <clears throat> but I also like the outdoors, and I like open spaces, and I don't like crowds. And so when I uh, moved into what was then a little town of Vital Falls, uh, the Snake River flowed right through the middle of town. Uh, <clears throat> every place you could go, you could park your car and walk away without asking permission because it's, it's public lands, and almost the entire state. And uh, that was really appealing. And, and in those days, uh, the mountains weren't as steep as they are now, so I enjoyed hiking and fishing and hunting and all of the things associated with, with Idaho and the outdoors. And uh, <clears throat> I... Uh, really enjoyed it. When you're young, uh, you don't really know about winters and things. Getting stuck is an adventure, not a disaster like it is when you're older. And uh, so, um, so I've liked it. It's a, it's a great place to live. It's, I still like the freedom of all the public lands and the freedom to do lots of different kinds of things. I sometimes, as I get older, catch myself saying, why did I spend my whole life in this guy's forsaken place where the wind blows all the time and it's 20 below in the winter and that, but you know, that's looking back on it now. And, and I, again, if I ever get to retire, I think the winters won't be as bad because when you don't have to go someplace, snowstorms aren't as bad. <laughs> so yeah, it's been, life living here has been a great experience. Is there any cultural shock involved for you coming to a place <coughs> Uh, yes, I think that there, there was some, some uh, distinct cultural differences between where I grew up and, and living here. I was introduced to that a little bit uh, during the year in graduate school down at Utah State. And <clears throat> what I found was, um, I think as a result of a less population density, uh, and a lot of freedom and open spaces, people uh, seem a lot friendlier and less inclined to interfere with what you're doing, and I really enjoy that. Um, I know that I, at some point in time when I was in graduate school down in Utah, said, oh, I'll never go back to Illinois. You know, I think at that time even I decided that this is a really nice area, and the people are friendly and helpful. Um, they, it's just a, a, a lot different than where where every scrap of land is owned by someone else and you have to have their permission to even be on it and, and things. So I, I think it's fine, the cultural differences uh, uh, and religious differences. You know, uh, where I grew up there was a Catholic church and everyone else and here there's the Mormon church and everyone else. And, and so uh, that wasn't a, a big difference to me really. Uh, it was kind of refreshing. Did you meet your wife here? Yeah, I did. Uh -huh. Good she, story. Yeah. <laughs> That's I what, worked down so, the hall from oh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I've worked uh, uh, in a new uh, research laboratory at Central 
and uh, Gaylene worked in the for the SPURT program and, and their a data reduction uh, group just down the hall from me and uh, uh, she wore a spotted leopard coat that was uh, got your attention <laughs> and a fellow that I worked with I was single and and you know married people can't stand single people being around <laughs> and so so he kept uh, insisting that he he rode the same bus that Gaylene did and he kept insisting he was going to get me a date with this gal and I had noticed her at the cafeteria and down the hall already and I decided I'd better do something about that before he tries to set me up with somebody I don't know so I asked her out and that's how we met and she actually worked here several years I think before we started a family and, and uh, so so that uh, that also helps tie you to the area when you know the in-laws live here and and your wife's from here, so that's that's a, a, c a cement that yeah. that keeps you here. And I, I just, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I've I've had uh, so many different experiences. Um, when they were building ATR, one of my jobs was uh, that thing uh, had a lot of water hammer associated with uh, huge amounts of flow in the large pipes, and and uh, it tried to shake itself apart. And so uh, I was in the instrumentation uh, group at that time, and. I spent a lot of nights crawling around in those pipes, uh, installing strain gauges and accelerometers to try to figure out why, why it was shaking so badly. <laughs> and uh, each project I've worked on has had interesting little things like that associated with it. You know, the loft program uh, just had uh, some of the most wonderful research associated with trying to measure uh, temperatures in the core. While, while the fuel was melting. That's a very difficult thing to do and that, that presented lots and lots of challenges. Uh, when PBF, the Power Burst facility, came along and, and the, the challenge there was not so much in operating the reactor and running the test, but it was in building the fueled test trains, instrumented test trains that would go into to, uh, that reactor for testing and uh, so that became a day and night job to try to catch up on the the, the delivery schedule for those uh, things. And then when decommissioning came along, <coughs> it was just wonderful to convert those old buildings to something useful that a new program could go in. And then when we became more aware of environmental things and, and the old buildings were really worn out, it became wonderful to take that old building with lots of contamination and that looked like a plumber's nightmare and convert it to a, a newly seeded grassy area. And uh, you know, there's some satisfaction in uh, uh, walking away from a project like that. And then uh, in both the instrumentation areas and in the decommissioning area, I've been really uh, fortunate to get a lot of international recognition. Again, because I think Idaho uh, has been a leader in lots of those areas. And so it's fun to be involved on an international level with uh, people who are doing the same kinds of things you are and are very interested in what you've learned. And I mentioned that just last fall I spent two and a half months in Scotland at the Dune Ray facility because they now have a 60 year uh, decommissioning program laid out to decommission all the facilities on their site which is very much like our site. It's the INEEL of, of the, the UK. <laughs> and so to be able to work with them and uh, see the problems they have and share what we've learned uh, it was just really fun, really a fun thing. So it's been a, been a good career.